The British man of letters Edmund Burke founded modern conservatism in the 18th century. Today, a British man of letters is redefining conservative for the 21st. With us today, Sir Roger Scruton. Uncommon knowledge now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Born in Lincolnshire during the Second World War, the philosopher Roger Scruton represents one of Britain's most significant conservative intellectuals. In the words of one observer, quote, England's most accomplished conservative since Edmund Burke, close quote. Knighted last year, Sir Roger holds undergraduate and doctoral degrees from Cambridge. He is the author of more than 50 books. You write faster than I can read including his most recent book on human nature and his classic work, How to Be a Conservative. Sir Roger Scruton, welcome. Thank you. From How to Be a Conservative, it is not unusual to be a conservative, <clears throat> but it is unusual to be an intellectual conservative. In both Britain and America, some 70% of academics identify themselves as on the left, while the surrounding culture is increasingly hostile to traditional values, or to any claim that might be made for the high achievements of Western civilization. The press, the bureaucracy, the universities, all hostile to conservatism. Why? It's a very good question. Uh, I think I, I spent my life trying to answer it, in fact. Uh, my impression is that this hostility comes in part because People who self-identify as intellectuals and thinkers also want to identify themselves as in some way outside the community, standing in judgment on it, gifted with superior insight and intellect, uh, and therefore I inevitably critical of whatever, whatever it is that ordinary people do by way of surviving. You know, uh, and so, so we have created an intellectual class which which by its nature does not identify with the way of life around it uh, and, uh, and tries to gain another kind of identity through its critical stance. And, 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 and produces the paradox that within academic circles and within the press, to be a liberal instead of a conservative is almost boringly conventional. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, that, that's right. There is a, it is, the convention is to be hostile to conventions. Right, right. You begin, <clears throat> I'm showing this book because I want everybody to get a good look at it. It's a wonderful book. You begin How to Be a Conservative with a marvelous essay on your own journey from left to right. And you identify a couple of events in particular as crucial in that journey. In the spring of 1968, you're in Paris. Mass protests take place across France. I quote, how to be a conservative, May of 1968 led me to understand what I value in the customs, institutions, and culture of Europe. Paris explodes, and young Roger Scruton decides to become conservative, not to join the students yeah. in the street. Why? Well, uh, uh, gosh, why? I, I mean, f for a start, the thing that most struck me about those students in the street was the um, sentiment, sentimentality of their anger. It, it was all about themselves. It wasn't about anything objective. Uh, here they were, the spoiled middle-class baby boomers who'd never had any real difficulty to cope with, uh, shouting their heads off in the street, uh, burning the cars belonging to ordinary proletarians whom they pretended to be defending against some imaginary oppressive structures erected by the bourgeoisie. The whole thing was a, a complete uh, fiction based on uh, the antiquated ideas of Karl Marx, ideas which were already redundant in the mid-19th century. Th they were enacting out, uh, if you like, a, a self-scripted drama in which the, the central character was themselves. Mm. Again, from How to Be a Conservative, only someone raised in the Anglosphere could believe, as I believed in the aftermath of 1968, that the political alternative to revolutionary socialism is conservatism. Mm. Only someone raised in the Anglosphere. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I think if you look 
uh, around the world at uh, those political parties and political movements that identify themselves as conservative. It's only in Britain, America, Australia, um, possibly India, that people would even use that word. Um, because uh, there is a tradition uh, uh, which we have inherited from Edmund Burke and the reaction to the, cons to the French Revolution of, uh, of, of recognizing that, that um, there is an alternative to revolutionary change and that is not changing. Uh, and this extraordinary original idea only enters the heads of English speaking people. I don't know why, but it's something to do with the English language. It's sort of accommodation of, uh, of uh, eccentricities, the fact that we live a life based on compromise, the common law, which tells us that the ordinary person is in charge of the law, not the people there who are uh, pretending to impose it on him. You know, all those things which we've inherited for, uh, for, uh, uh, from hundreds of years, actually, of, uh, of discussion and debate, they make it natural for us to say, to say you know, let's not change. Mm. The second large event in your own journey, a visit to Poland and Czechoslovakia in 1979 awoke me to the fraud that had been committed in socialism's name and I mm. felt an immediate obligation to do something about it. Mm. 79, the Pope visits Poland, you get the feeling that things are beginning to break up but it's still, the, the iceberg is still sitting on Eastern Europe. Yeah. What happened in, in Czechoslovakia and Poland? What did you see? What did, how, did, how were you well, awakened? Well, I, I was there in Poland in the wake of the po Pope's ah, pil pil pilgrimage to his country. Um, uh, and there was a visible sense of, uh, that, that we, are, we Poles are together against this thing which controls us. Uh, but people, of course, couldn't, openly talk about it, uh, uh, and, um, but, but the people I met talked to me about it. Uh, and um, then when going to Czechoslovakia, where of course the oppression was much heavier, mm. um, I, I got involved in talking to people who were actually trying to organize underground uh, seminars at university, uh, underground, well, curriculum, if you like, for young people who have been excluded from the system. Um, where there was a real consciousness that, that um, it was a life and death struggle. Either these societies were going to be finally killed off by communism or people were going to try and keep them alive in the catacombs. And it was my first vision of a catacomb culture that, which, um, as it were, reenacted what the earlier, early Christians had to go through in the uh, Roman Empire. Now, you, you also say you felt an immediate obligation to do something about it. And as I, here, correct me, but as I understand your well, your training, your formal training is as a philosopher. Yeah. And in your lifetime, philosophy has gone off in all kinds of directions, in this country in particular, and headed off in, in the direction of formal logic. Yes. I take it that you decided that you intended to, to continue to do the work. You intended to work in the tradition of Aristotle, philosophy, as it bears on ordinary political life. Is that correct? Well, yes. I've always th thought that philosophy um, has ordinary life as its subject matter. That's what it's about. But um, it is also a reflection on ordinary life and its meaning. But when it came to uh, working in Eastern Europe, my main thought was that, that uh, what young people there especially needed was not uh, not merely philosophy, but, but uh, the whole range of knowledge which had been excluded for, uh, from the official curriculum. For instance, knowledge of history, um, not knowledge of, uh, of literature, not, uh, a knowledge of the way in which those things connect, how, how music and art and literature feed into a vision of, of, of your society, and of course knowledge of the religious traditions of their countries. Now all those things uh, had been excluded by the Communist Party from, from the national sense of identity. Uh, but it didn't, um, uh, it didn't alter my view that they'd also been excluded <laughs> from our societies too by the universities themselves. Mm. You know, um, most young people today leave a university ha having studied history but not actually knowing very much about it. 
They will know about the periods of revolutionary struggle and other things that have, that have appealed to their professors as, as part of their own self-glorification. But they won't know the, the sort of things that are, as it were, interred within the spirit of the people. Mm. Your visit to Poland and Czechoslovakia took place again in 1979. Mrs. Thatcher becomes prime minister in the same year. <clears throat> Your views of Mrs. Thatcher are a little more complicated I think that an American conservative would expect to read picking up a book entitled How to Be a Conservative. On the one hand, and again I'm quoting, in the midst of our discouragement, Margaret Thatcher appeared as though by a miracle. And that surely, I, uh, mm. that surely is the way it felt to many people. On the other hand, and again I'm quoting Roger Scruton, quote, I never swallowed in its entirety the free market rhetoric mm. of the Thatcherites close quote. So explain that. She's this miraculous being, but there's a lot yeah. of hogwash involved. Well, she came into, into our lives as a representative of our country at a time when the country looked particularly enfeebled by, um, by the trade unions, by the whole Labour Party attempt to rope, the, rope society into a, a communal prison uh, run by the state. All that was wonderful. We felt, you know, phew, we don't actually have to go along with all that crap. We can, we can do our own thing uh, and we can revert to our natural condition as, as uh, rebellious, eccentric Englishmen. But um, she felt that she had to embellish it with a complete doctrine, which she borrowed from the Institute of Economic Affairs, mm -hmm. you know, about the, the, the need for a market solutions to every social problem. Uh, now, I'm all in favor of market solutions uh, where they apply, but not a, every social problem does have a, a market solution. And there, are, there is a need for the maintenance of, of traditions in, in education uh, and in culture uh, and in the law, which are not traditions of free enterprise, but much more conditions of uh, uh, some kind of collective renunciation. Uh, you know, the, uh, the people renunciation of the state. Uh, no, renunciation of one's own uh, individuality. You know, that's what a culture is, uh, partly. So, and I think she wasn't sensitive to, to all that part, aspect of things. And you have to remember that we inherited, at the time when she became prominent, we inherited a, uh, a society and an economy that had been radically changed by the Second World War and by the socialist governments that yes. came into being because of the Second World War. Yes. You know, people, people wanted a government based on planning because they had felt that it, the, war, the war showed the need for planning. If, if it hadn't been for planning, we wouldn't have survived it. And we almost didn't survive it because people weren't ready for it, etc. Well, I'm, actually, let me pursue that point, if I may, because of course, needless to say, here we sit in Washington in the mm -hmm. second month of the Trump administration, so I'm going to I'm going to haul you from Margaret Thatcher to Donald Trump, mm. with, if, if, even if you come screaming. Mm. So again, how to be a conservative. Pressed for arguments, I'm quoting you, Mrs. Thatcher leaned too readily on market economics and ignored the deeper roots of conservatism in the theory and practice of civil society. You've just said this, but I want to put, yeah. tee it up again. Family, civil association, the Christian religion and the common law were all integrated into her ideal of freedom of the law, the pity was that she had no philosophy with which to articulate that idea. Mm. She felt it, she knew it, yeah. but she'd not thought it through and yes. in, a, in a way that permitted her to articulate it. All right, here's Mrs. Thatcher. Now if I may go a step backward, and I am doing something very dangerous because my knowledge of this history is tenuous and yours will be deep. Winston Churchill had the capacity to articulate this mm. deeper conservatism. Throughout the war, he's talking about love of native land. Mm. He uses the phrase, he actually uses the phrase, which would today have the man thrown in jail, he uses the phrase Christian civilization. Mm. And yet, in the 1945 election, in the face of the socialists, because he lacked a vocabulary to talk about free markets, he was naked before mm. Attlee and this socialist impulse. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm getting at is, it almost, of course, I want to come to American, the American situation in a moment, but it almost seems to me as though there's a kind of ideological teeter-totter. Conservatives in Britain either get to talk about free markets 
or they get to talk Churchill, Macmillan, mm. even to the extent that he talked about anything, Heath later on, or they get to try to talk about cultural conservatism. Mm. Somehow the two don't seem to go together. Yeah. Is there some reason for that, or is it mere happenstance? Mm, no, that's a very um, insightful observation. I think uh, since Edmund Burke, we've had this this tension mm. between the uh, adoption of, uh, of the free market uh, as the instrument of economic uh, organization, the, in the primary way in which a society should uh, create and exchange goods, uh, and uh, the, the sense that some things should be withheld from the market, and that those things are just as important, um, but much more difficult to defend. And, uh, and of course, Burke was talking about those things that should be withheld from the market, uh, love, family, and, and so on. Uh, we've, all societies have recognized from the beginning of history that a market in sexual relations is the end of all co co social co coherence. Um, but it's, been, it's always very hard to say why. But, and that's just one example. Uh, and you know, all the things that matter to us, as soon as we recognize how much they matter, we want to withdraw them from the whole business of exchange and proliferation. Uh, and as it were, hug them to ourselves, and that is uh, th it's that aspect of humanity which is so difficult to to articulate. Mm. Uh, with, but as you rightly say, Churchill did articulate it, and it's it because it, it's so much easier when it's under threat. I see. Um, of course. All right, <coughs> we're creeping up to Trump, but first, one more mm. large question about Britain: Brexit. Mm. Last June, the United Kingdom held a referendum on whether to remain in or to leave the European Union and overturning the predictions of virtually every poll mm. and virtually every, every pundit. Um, I myself, as I'm sure you, I was on the telephone to friends, in very, I thought, well-informed friends, and the most pro-Brexit prediction I got on the day of the voting was, it'll be very touch and go, we'll have to see. Mm. Everybody expected, almost everybody expected mm. it to fail, and it carried, 52 to 48%, mm. close, but at the same time, unambiguous. Mm. Sir Roger Scruton, speaking on the BBC soon afterwards, quote, the experts failed to see that the British people are profoundly democratic and do not accept to be governed by bureaucrats who are not accountable for their mistakes, close quote. Mm. Now, one hears it said over and over and over again that it was xenophobia, mm. the Brexit was a reaction against immigration, mm. and Roger Scruton says it was a blow for democracy. Mm. Explain. Well, it could be both, <laughs> uh, but uh, I think what has been the, the feelings of opposition to the European Union um, of much um, longer standing than the recent feelings about the mass immigration from Europe, um, and they have been about democratic accountability. The thought being that you know, more than half, I think in nearly two-thirds of the laws rubber stamped by our parliament originate in Brussels in the minds of bureaucrats who have no knowledge of or interest in the peculiar social conditions uh, of Britain, which are very peculiar because we haven't been interfered with in this way before. Um, so, uh, and people have resented that and rightly, because after all, what is democracy? It is the, if it's not the ability of a people to decide for themselves about the laws that operate in the country that is theirs. Uh, you know, and that, I, that reference to the country, the, our country, is absolutely fundamental to the democratic idea. Um, it is true, of course, that, that, that British people also reacted strongly to the mass immigration at the rate of something like 300,000 uh, 300, a year of people from the former communist countries. You know, they, they were brought into the European Union without any mandate, any popular mandate from the existing members. They were people living in, a country, in countries ruined by communism, suddenly given the opportunity to settle in places which were not so ruined. Uh, England, um, or in particular and Britain in general, um, has the advantage that its um, infrastructure was not destroyed in the war. Right. It, it, it speaks the international language. Uh, you know, the freedom to settle there and to enjoy what the British people had 
uh, defended at great cost to themselves uh, it was suddenly offered to these people. Inevitably, they all transferred to Britain. It, and it's not xenophobia to, to recognize that your life, if you're an ordinary person, that your life has been changed when suddenly people better qualified than you are uh, competing for your job, where your child is going to a school where English is the second language, where your uh, right to social housing has been conferred on people who never paid anything to obtain it, etc. Right. Uh, right. So, one more question about Brexit. <clears throat> You've spoken about the peculiar customs of Britain. You've spoken about the distinctiveness of the Anglosphere. So, is it your position? Is it your position simply that Britain ought to have left the European Union, or is it your position that the European Union in it is bad for everyone? I mean, mm -hmm. one can see the Germans with war guilt. It would be lovely if they could dissolve themselves in, in, in a new sense of mm. international identity. Spain wanting to rejoin Europe after the years of being cut off under France. You could create a mm. kind of psychological case for every continent. The Italians would far rather have their money supply run by good, steady Germans than by their fellow mm. Italians, and so on and so forth. So the European Union, let the continent have it. It's just that it's improper for us to be in. Mm. Let us be out. Or the European Union is a nasty piece of work in and of itself? Well, I, I would say, when I did say this prior to the vote, that, um, that what is needed is not simply for us to withdraw from the treaty. What is needed is a new treaty, one that we could accept and that everybody else could accept too. Uh, and my view is that treaties are dead hands. They weigh upon you. Um, maybe beneficially if they're restraining you from doing something that would otherwise uh, be destructive, as tr peace treaties do, mm -hmm. um, but they might actually prevent you from taking the measures needed to cope with the new situations. And no tr treaties don't adapt, and the more signatories to them there are, the less likely it is that they ever will adapt. Uh, and that is the problem. We were living under a treaty uh, signed 60, uh, 60 or conceived 70 years ago by people long since dead in a situation that has vanished. Uh, why should we be governed by it? Because um, it, it, it's un, unusual for a treaty in that it sets up a system of government. Um, and so you have a system of government which is essentially non-adaptable. My view is get rid of it and, get a, and everybody come together again uh, seeing if they can get another kind of treaty which answers to all their separate national interests. Um, you know, the, the Poles, take the Poles, they, they, they thought it was great to join the, the, the treaty because at last they would have a system of law which, which would replace the complete nonsense of communist legality. They had the access to proper infrastructure and markets uh, and so on. What they did not realize is that they would also lose all their youth. Mm. So that Poland is in a state of demographic collapse. Everyone goes off to yeah, London. Uh, so, to, to so, yeah, so clearly, um, you know, each country has a different problem. Likewise, the, the Greeks thought, you know, great, the single currency, as you say, is, we can transfer all our debts to those reliable Germans. Uh, and then suddenly they realized, but of course, we can no longer govern our economy as we used to by periodic uh, devaluation, uh, and the result is a total collapse in youth employment. This country, Trump. From the mm. British referendum <clears throat> on Brexit to the election of Donald Trump, Sir Roger Scruton in a talk on the BBC the week after the American election, quote, in America as in Britain, the indigenous working class has been put out of mind, even overtly disparaged by the media and the political class. Mm. All attempts to give voice to their anxieties over immigration, over the impact on their lives of globalization, and the spread of liberal conceptions of sex, marriage, and the family have been dismissed or silenced." Close quote. First question, how can it be that when Franklin Roosevelt, seven decades ago, in establishing modern conservatism, the, I beg your pardon, modern liberalism, the mm. democratic of which the Democratic Party is the great champion, he placed the working class at the very center of mm -hmm. that coalition. How can it be that these decades later, that same party, that same liberalism has turned its back 
mm. on the indigenous working class. How did it happen? Yes, it, well, it's happened everywhere. Uh, I think, again, it's one of those deep mysteries, but I think there are two important factors that contributed to this. One is that the, um, the change in the economy which has transferred an awful lot of economic activity to service activities, um, to uh, thing, activities that could be conducted through the internet or through, um, or, or through companies based outside the jurisdiction, all that. It means that the old traditional working class, it, it no longer has that cohesion that it had before, and it's no longer an identifiable social mass in the way that it was in Roosevelt's day. That's one very important thing. The, the other important thing is that the, the liberal um, establishment has ceased to represent the interests of that class anyway. It represents the interests of people who are saying that they represent the interests of that class. It's a self-serving ideology of people who want to appear virtuous without the cost of it. Uh, and people in the media, uh, the, the administration and so on, who love the image of themselves as defenders of the people, but recognize that when in the proximity of the people, they feel nothing except repugnance. You're making a moral point. Pride, mm. vanity, it all happened through pride and vanity and sloth and inattention on the part of very comfortable people. Well, th there is that, uh, I tell that's only one factor. All right. There are all also right. lots of good people who are liberals who, right. who really do worry about these things. Right. But I'm just talking about these uh, new social factors, yes. which we have to recognize. You, you mentioned these factors that are legitimate concerns, anxieties over immigration. Now, again, one we'll hear over and over again, uh, the American anxiety over immigration is xenophobia. It's just, it's mm. just immoral to, to, to think you can draw a line at the border and keep out the, the people in the south of the border have mm. immortal souls just as mm. those, well, of course, the liberal would doubt that, but they're worth, they have as much value as, mm. all right. Then the other bit one here is, is it just economically, the more immigration, the more the economy grows? And then a kind of counter argument, but still it's the argument against the, the concern for immigration. Um, immigration has slowed as, Mexican, as the Mexican middle class has risen and mm. partly because our economy is slow. Mm. Net, net immigration from Mexico is almost zero and net immigration from everywhere else in the world is a million people a year, and in a population of 330 million, you can live with that. Mm. So there are all these arguments. Why should anyone be anxious over immigration? And yet you would argue, I think I take you to argue, that it is actually a legitimate concern mm. in this country. Well, <clears throat> yes, I, I mean, Again, there are many factors, but illegal immigration has been a great concern to people. There are 10 million illegal immigrants, possibly, in this country. Um, and I think ordinary people say, look, if, some, if the first thing that somebody does when coming into the country is to commit a crime, uh, should he really be allowed to stay? You know, I think this is a very strong argument. Um, uh, of course, legal immigration which has the consent of Congress and therefore the consent and indirectly of the people is not something that uh, that people are complaining about in this not in the same tone of voice in any way um, but then again you have to recognize that what is being asked of the people is to offer hospitality to those who are not currently part of their home uh, you can offer hospitality to others if you have a secure home from which to offer it. But if that home has become insecure, um, as it, it has in large parts of, of Europe because of immigration, right. then what, what are you asking of people? You're asking of them essentially uh, to deterritorialize themselves, to detach themselves from the, from the place that is theirs, you know, without giving them any alternative. The spread, another of the concerns that you mentioned, I'm quoting you again, the spread of liberal conceptions of sex, marriage, and the family. Mm. And this is a legitimate concern. I'm, it, here's the difficulty about that one. All the figures, divorce rate, illegitimacy rates, and so forth, all these are at least as high among what, it depends on how you would define mm. the indigenous working class and so forth. Mm. but. The argument could be made that the indigenous class has no right to be 
the indigenous working class, again, I'm using your phrase, the indigenous working class has no right to be upset about these liberal conceptions of sex and marriage in the family because they're the ones who've embraced them. Mm. To which Roger, Sir Roger Scruton replies, well, um, I, re I would reply that just that the, we all of us fall away from the standards that are required in this area. That is not undoubtedly the case because this is the, the biggest area of temptation. Uh, but it is also the biggest area in which examples are needed and in which a culture of resistance is needed. That culture of resistance was absolutely vital to the protection of the working class family uh, and, uh, and especially of children uh, you know, who, who need a father at home uh, and have lost that protection. Um, and it is undeniable that it's liberal propaganda which has made it almost impossible to say the, the, those things. And it's not possible to say the things uh, that are needed in this area unless you're Charles Murray and don't care about what's said about you anyway. Or Sir Roger Scruton. Well, uh, yeah. That I mean, makes two of you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, the, the point is it's an area in which the truth has been made unsayable by the, the uh, liberal censorship. All right. And along comes Donald Trump. Mm. And whereas Mrs. Thatcher made, not exclusively, but made largely economic arguments, Donald Trump is making different kinds of arguments. He make America great again. Mm. Does Roger Scruton approve of the 45th Chief Executive of the United States? Well, that's a direct question, which is not um, strictly relevant to my vision of the world. Uh, but uh, um, rewrite the question. Uh, the, how do you want to grapple with Donald Trump? Um, well, I'd rather not. <laughs> uh, but, um, of course, the, his defects of character are so manifest that one can, uh, as it were, um, recognize, the, 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 um, re recognize that he's put you in a, a new position. You know, uh, you, you've got, he is the, the legitimate president of the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, he won the election on the basis of things which were rightly said. Some things were rightly said. Um, and also on the basis of other things which you could criticize, mm. uh, which perhaps should not have been but said. Did, so but did he have the virtue, to go back to the point you were just making, did he have the virtue at points during the campaign, many points during the campaign, of saying the unsayable. Yes, th th one of the reasons why he was elected is exactly that. Uh, and uh, this is one thing that I said in my BBC talk that you referred to earlier, that, that um, uh, people have been living under a regime of liberal censorship, which makes it very hard to say things without being accused of faults like racism, xenophobia. You yourself mentioned this. Uh, which nobody wants to be accused of, but which are very easy to, uh, these are accusations which are very e easy to make because there's no criterion on the basis of which to make them other than the, than the, the feelings involved. Mm. Uh. So, if I may, maybe this is the way to ask you to address Donald Trump, mm. a man who's resistant to grapple with him. Uh, Trump and his critics, and as I read it, and I have a couple of quotations here for you. Criticisms of Donald Trump you'll recognize, partly of course because you follow mm. the American scene very closely, but partly because they echo or have echoes mm. in Britain. Here's John McCain speaking very recently, Senator John McCain speaking very recently at the Munich Security Conference in uh, oblique, but not that oblique, criticism of the president. What would the founders of this security conference say if they saw our world today? They would be alarmed by an increasing turn away from universal values and toward old ties of blood and race and sectarianism, close mm. quote. Donald Trump and also Sir Roger Scruton champion the native land, the, the indigenous, the, 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 mm. the, the, the organic culture. And here you, you, that can be called, you're, you want to turn us back to blood and soil, blood yeah. and race and sectarianism. Yeah, you see, that, that's the kind of language which I, uh, I reject. Uh, I, my, my view is that, that, that the country is a vital part of our identity. 
I don't mean by that blood and soil in the Nazi sense. I mean this land, the place where our jurisdiction operates. And this is a cr crucial thing about the national idea. It's an, a defense of territorial jurisdiction against religious or quasi-religious jurisdictions, like the universal doctrine of human rights or the Sharia, uh, to, to take another competitor. We live, and we are fortunate to live, in countries where the law is defined by the land over which it operates. And within that land, of course, there is a sense of belonging on which the law draws for, for the democratic process. This isn't, there's nothing blood and soil about this. It's, it's to do with neighborhood. Uh, uh, we, have, we, we are settled among neighbors. We want to get along with them. We don't want to force them to agree with us about everything, nor do we require them to be of the same race, whatever that means. But we do require them to share our commitment to the place where we are, because this is where we're building a home. And other people might want to come into that home, and we, we should be entitled to invite them, provided they agree to abide by the rules. Um, all this is perfectly reasonable, in my view, uh, and uh, it's only because the left have dominated the language in which these things are discussed that my reasonable position can be made to look like that unreasonable position uh, which you were just um, attributing. One more, one more criticism of Trump, and this is his now famous executive order imposing a temporary travel ban from mm. seven countries in the Middle East where there has been terrorism. Seven. Mm. Muslim majority countries, as yeah. the press put it in reporting on this. And one of the sources of immediate criticism was the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Here's their statement, quote, the, part of their statement. The bond between Christians and Muslims is founded on the unbreakable strength of charity and justice. Welcoming the stranger is the very form of Christianity itself. The actions of our government must remind people of basic humanity. Close quote. Well, there you get, you've heard this before, there you get the notion that drawing lines at the border is, mm. from the Catholics, it's unchristian, from others, it's immoral. Mm. Who are you? Who was Donald Trump? Who was Sir Roger Scruton? Who was uh, Prime Minister May? To say, we have the right to keep people out. Mm. Well, I mean, you have a house which you share with your wife and children or assuming you have had them. Um, and uh, you do recognize a right to keep out of that house people whom you've not invited in, don't you? I do. Uh, and uh, having invited people in who start smashing things up, you ha recognize a right to exclude them. I do. Yeah, and that, just multiply that by a few hundred um, thousand and you'll recognize that people taken as a whole have that right. That is part, another part of, of democracy, that we live in a place, we have the right to exclude from that place those whom we think are not going to fit into it or to whom we don't want to extend a welcome. Um, this is, uh, if we were, didn't have that right, we wouldn't feel secure in occupying the place that we claim as ours. Mm. Uh, this is a, it's a simple part of human nature and although I, I think Trump should never have mentioned the, the Muslim idea yes. in this, that because that goes against the whole American tradition that, that religion is not what it's about, but, but settlement. You know, nevertheless, um, he, he wasn't exceeding the, the natural powers of a president in saying what he said. Um, if he'd left out that right. uh, 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 reference to religion. And, um, it, you know, he did make various promises to people Bit prior to the election, which he is obviously under some obligation to follow through anyway. Last question, Sir mm. Roger. If I feel this way to some extent, actually I feel this way to a great extent, I'll just ask this question on my own behalf. I was mm. about to hide behind and say, there will be people who are listening to this feel. Mm. I won't do that. I'll say, I feel it myself wonderfully compelling, everything you say, hugely attractive. But here's where I, and, and it causes my, it fills, fills the heart with hope. There's a way forward. But then comes the thought, oh, but 
it's nostalgic. Mm. It's the Shire. It's Tolkien, for goodness sake. Mm. Even England isn't green and pleasant in quite the same way anymore. And we've got in Britain itself this massive, for all one can see, permanent state apparatus. And in this country, as President Trump is about to find out, as Republicans who now hold both houses of Congress and can barely pull themselves together to figure out how to deal with Obamacare are finding out, there is such a thing as the permanent state. Mm. And we live in a modern world and for seven decades, at least seven decades in both your country and my, in throughout the Anglosphere, let's, let's, I'll grant you mm. the Anglosphere, the state has expanded and expanded and expanded. And I love the world that you describe with the same yearning love that I, with which I love Tolkien. Mm. But they belong on the bookshelf together. It's mm. not a practical agenda. Right. Tell me why I'm wrong, and please tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs> well, uh, you're not entirely wrong. Oh. Um, there, the expansion of the state to absorb more and more of civil society has happened everywhere, more outside the Anglosphere than inside the Anglosphere. Let's face it, you still have private education available yes. here if you want it and can afford it. You still have all the little little platoons, as Burke called them. You, if you have a problem, you can get together with your neighbors to, um, to solve it. Uh, you can, you know, you, you probably belong to all sorts of clubs and, and, uh, and discussion groups and so on. Uh, uh, you know, all that free association, which made the, the uh, English-speaking countries what they are, still exists. It's just that there's a, a tax on it uh, roughly speaking, half of what you ever you earn, yes. which goes to maintain uh, a, 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 a sort of shadow community of parasites, who uh, whose only justification is that they pretend to be governing us. Uh, you have to, you know, you, you, we're, we belong in an organism which goes, which is accompanied by a cancerous version of itself. That's the way it is. Uh, all you can do is is every now and then diminish it, if, uh, you know, dim to cut off this or that bit of it. But it will always be there. Um, but n at the same time, focusing on the other thing is not nostalgia. Although uh, nostalgia is an underrated um, uh, aspect of the human condition. Remember the, the founding work of literature of our civilization describes Odysseus's decision to give up immortality and life with the goddess in order to travel across dangerous seas to his home. You know, it set the model for what, we are, what all our literature since has been about and all our art. And why turn away from that? That is, we are in this world in a, as uh, dispossessed and alienated and we do have that longing for a home and we try to build it. And that's all I'm advocating is that we should go on doing this. It will always be a different home but, um, but, you know, it isn't anyway nostalgia to say that, that this is where our values lie rather than in that other thing, that great expanding state machine. All right. That was penultimate question. Here's the last question. Mm. Brexit has happened. Britain has a new government. Uh, there hasn't been an election. It's still the Tories, but you have a new prime minister. Mm. And we have a new president. Are you hopeful? Uh, I've never in my life been hopeful. Um, I take the view that pessimism is the wise uh, position to adopt because you're always agreeably surprised. <laughs> uh. <laughs> All right. Sir so Roger Scruton, hmm. author of more than 50 books, including the superb How to Be a Conservative. Thank you. Thank you. For the Hoover Institution at Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson. <laughs>